Hello and welcome to Creative Ghettos, the show that explores various creative industries and profiles the Africans who push them forward. Each week I spend 30 minutes unveiling excellent and exciting progress within creative industries, including but not limited to fine art, architecture, design, food, film and publishing. My name is Gwane Lugunene. Thank you for joining me right here on brandlive.co.za. If the notion of destiny is true, that somehow we design every aspect of our lives prior to or even at birth, then Linda Mvusi, who is the principal architect at Linda Mvusi Architects and Design, must have had a checklist that sounded like this. Design 114 buildings spread out across four continents, become a high school teacher, brave legal and political adversity to start and run an architectural practice, do a little bit of acting on the side and while you're at it, win the Best Actress Award at the Cannes Film Festival. <laughs> I don't know how you did it. Linda Bussi is my guest today. Mom Linda, welcome to Creative Ghettos. Thank you for inviting me, Quanella. Oh, thank you for coming. I'm I'm it's so thrilled. To meet I'm you so finally. thrilled and honored. Yes, 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 you too. So okay, we're gonna get into it. You were born in Bloemfontein. Yeah. But you grew up in various parts of the continent. How old were you when you left South Africa? And, and was the constant uh, transition hard, hard on you? Not really. I left South Africa as five years and 14 days um, with my family. My mm-hmm. parents were in the States. They returned to fetch my brother and myself. And we've pretty much spent 32 years in exile twice around Africa, um, Europe, States, and back to Africa. So um, one advantage was that my parents were professionals. So um, they were in exile as expatriates. And if you're an an expatriate child, your life is in blocks of four because you're four years, because your parents' contracts are in four Mm. years. So... um, You're pretty much a nomad, and um, certainly travel is second nature to you. And therefore change is also second nature to you. You adapt to that. That Mm. That is your background. So the world is your home. Basically, the world is your backyard. <laughs> Everywhere except South Africa. <laughs> well, I suppose, and somehow, yeah. was it the dream? Uh, I, well, I don't know. Was that the, a, 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 a fairy tale life that you were leading for some for some time? Did you ever feel as though, I don't know, you missed South Africa or there was something that tied you to South Africa that you felt you missed within those 32 years? Not really, because... You're a child and that's your life. Okay. Um, but also there are a lot of, for us, a lot of South Africans in exile. Mm. Um, the different political movements, um, liberation movements, um, but also a lot of the, that generation of Forte graduates, especially with Bantu education and the limitation, with a crackdown, in yeah. fact, of grand apartheid. A lot of the professional, my parents' generation, they mm. they chose to leave. And a lot of them actually went to Ghana because Ghana became independent in 1957. Yes. So you have a phenomena, especially if you're living in West, East, Central, Southern Africa, of having what we called aunts, South African aunts and uncles, basically. <laughs> um, again, that was a security measure mm. so that nobody could ask you, who is that South African? It's just another uncle. It's another aunt. Okay, so it was a great community. It's a it's a community, yeah. Okay. yes. Yeah. And uh, one strength of that community of, I'd say, South Africans in exile is that everybody sort of looked out for each other, you know. So you couldn't really be anonymous or alone in any country. Yes. Um, there'd always be a South African who's got a message, who'll come to the airport if you're in transit. Oh, hello. <laughs> Here are letters, exactly the way it is here at home. Yeah. Okay. So, what sparked your interest in design, in in designing buildings? Um, 
I have to give credit to my parents. I mean, I was born into um, an art house. My father, uh, Selby Mfusi, um, he established the first design school in Africa. Really? In 1964. Um, so, in fact, I need to add that both my parents being teachers, lecturers, yes. um, our life, my brothers and I, it was, we basically grew up on campuses. All over mm. Africa, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so your parents or your father was in the art and design industry, yeah, basically. And your mother? My mother's a teacher. Okay. Uh, math, literature. Um, at in the middle of exile, she became a principal. Mm -hmm. So the, that whole management, administration, uh, development. You know, one learnt from her. You know? So you so you kind of fused both their their professions and made it into yours in some sense. I'd say the opposite because <laughs> all three of us never ever wanted to be in our parents' professions, you know. Mm. And it's not it's it's unsurprising now to me that my brothers and I, we all studied architecture, you know. We, we never, all three of you? Yeah, all three of us, yes. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. And, and growing up all over, all over the world, um, who were the... Who, who made it easier for you, apart from your parents, who made it easier for you to, to think that you as a young female can be an architect and, and work at the highest level? I'd say everybody in my environment. Um, when I was six, we moved to Ghana, um, the University of Science and Technology, which actually is my first alma mater. Fifteen years later, I returned to study architecture there. Mm. And at the time, the campus was in construction, in modern architecture. You know, it's, it's, it's an amazing campus because it's, it's like a, a walkthrough library. Um, and this was being designed at the same time that uh, Le Corbusier was in India doing Chandigarh. Yeah. Um, some of his um, assistants, design assistants, uh, particularly Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew, they were designing the campus at Kumasi. So, I mean, this was Kwame Nkrumah's big dream of... Africa, industrialization, modernity. So there was a lot of excitement at that time about new structures, especially in... And new beginnings. And new beginnings. And democracy. And Africa was this amazing continent yeah. where so much can happen, you know. Yeah. And you have to admit that historically, when you look at it, um, Africa was on par with Asia. In fact, it was probably ahead, you know. So... Certainly on that campus when I was there, a lot of design luminaries passed through UST when I was there as a child. Um, uh, Buckminster Fuller, um, as far as I'm concerned, he's the, the visionary, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he came to um, UST when, when my parents were working there. Um, so later when I went back to university, you have all this knowledge of a particular place, a particular geographic place. And mm. it's not Buckminster Fuller in the United States. It's mm. Buckminster Fuller here in Ghana, in here in backyard. Kumasi. Yes. Yeah. And you could actually go into the library. It was in the reserve part. And you could see these portfolios of drawings, his sketches, you know. Um, and the, I think that's part of what um, perhaps there's a sort of disjuncture Mm. Uh, given our own particular history here mm. in South Africa, um, between what is wealth and what is what I call stuff. Um, because as far as I'm concerned, wealth is ideas, yes. you know. And it's something that we do very little, I think, with our own universities here in Africa, mm. where we give back to those institutions. We don't go back to our universities uh, we don't go back to give lectures, um, bequeath our drawings, bequeath mm. our models. Mm, mm. Um, and a, and an a, experience. Yeah, an experience. Yeah. Um, so that it becomes a sort of living history. It, mm. it becomes um, tactile. It becomes 
germane to the next generation. Yes. You know, that kind of thing. So if if I can explain it like that, mm. it's that for us growing up, even as teenagers, um, w- one was constantly in an environment of ideas, of concepts, whether it was literature, whether it was design, whether it was architecture. But what do you think the issue is now? Because I feel as though a lot of, and I, I and I don't believe that it, sh- it 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 is really something that should be uh, um, only a small group of of young people grow up in an environment like the one that you have described. What do you think the issue is right now that is making young people and and as people who are going to become young parents, um, um, you know, raise children in an environment where everything is you know, perishable and no one really cares about this moment and no one is creating in this moment. No one is is um, encouraging thoughtfulness about the things around them or, or having ideas about whatever it is that is around them. Um, perhaps it's activism, um, being active and being present in whatever you're doing. Um Gosh, that's a quite a profound question. Um, I wouldn't write it off and say this is not happening. Um, but I'd agree with you that perhaps it's sparse on the ground. Yeah. And perhaps it's because of, I hate to use the word because you have to break it down, but neoliberalism, okay. Okay. where everything is... I don't want to use the word commercialized, but everything is monetized, you know. Yeah. So even your time is monetized. Yeah. Um, and together with outsourcing, you know, th- these are th- the sort of big ideas which brought the world to a collision point basically 10 years ago, 2008, mm. um, where if it is not economic for you, you outsource it. Um, so parenting is outsourced. A lot of parents outsource parenting. Mm-hmm. Um, they think other people should do it. I mean, I was just watching television yesterday, the Gauteng um, Education Department, and it's conundrum with these schools and violent children yeah. and violent um, adults in child spaces. Um, I'd, I'm, I won't say my situation is everybody's situation, but what I do know in my family, but also in families like ours, um, whether they were South African or not, was that our parents were very, very present in in our schooling. Um, our parents were there for sports day. Our parents were there for open day. Um, our parents engaged the teachers, you know. Okay. So, you know, you're growing up in a Pan-African household. Yeah. And you know from your environment that history is this and this and this and this in Africa. Mm. And as a child, you speak up in class that, no, what is in this book is not true because I know <laughs> this and this and this and this, I suppose, what happened, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, and, I mean, yeah. And the teachers engage you because they know that you're informed by your parents. Ah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, The teachers know your parents. Yeah. You know. So if I stick to, let's say, education, um, one low hanging fruit is parent participation in schools. These schools are ours. These schools are funded by taxpayers. Yeah. Um, They're ours. They don't belong to anybody else. Mm. We had better be extremely present in in our children's schools and in the schools of children in our neighborhood. It takes a neighborhood to raise that is kids. So true. Yes, you know. So if you have extra books in your house that you no longer read, or your children have grown up, donate them to your neighborhood primary school. Yeah. If you have a violin that nobody is, find your neighborhood school and encourage further uh, creative it. activities. Yes. Okay. That kind of thing. So you taught in high schools. Uh, well, in, in one high school. If, if. Oh, that was that was a fluke, and it's just one of the <laughs> it's just one of the wonderful things about African countries, <laughs> because I was 
I'd finished A levels high school. Yeah, yeah. And if you're a child of a of a foreigner, yeah, um, an expatriate in a country, you yourself don't have a work permit, you know. Uh, but Zambia is a country where I grew up in. Mm. Um, I did the last of my high school there. I did my main high school there. And for reasons best known to themselves, the Zambian government put me on their payroll. <laughs> for math and art. <laughs> to go teach math and art in high school. <laughs> I was 19. Uh, oh, really? And my class, most of the class were older than me, but they listened. <laughs> And they learned. Are you serious? Yeah. Most people were older than you in the high school. Well, I was teaching the form fives, yes. You know. Form, form five, that's matric. Yeah, that's matric. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But, but you had a wealth of knowledge, clearly, and a, and a way with your words to inspire the young. And an absolute love of math. I mean, I saw ah. math like art. I saw math as this massive creative uh, numerical language mm. um, I cannot stress enough that language like music these are um, sorry math like music and even art fine art these are all languages it's not just the literary language you know and the sooner you imbue your child to have a multiplicity of languages the better their brain works you know, yeah. How did that experience, um, the teaching experience, influence your design principles further on? Did it in any way? Well, why I say it was a fluke was that I'd wanted to study design mm. and I couldn't get a scholarship to go to the universities that I wanted. Yeah. And a lot of the pressure was coming from the sponsors that, you know, I remember one particular, I think it was Middle European, uh, some agency, scholarship agency. And this man, he just shouted at me, you're supposed to be doing medicine, what have you. This is what Africa needs. And I shouted back. You know, people in the other office came out in the lobby. And I'm like, Africa needs design. And da 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 And I walked out and I banged the door. And I found myself in Cairo Road. Lusaga in those days was like a one, one street town. You know, okay. it's, Cairo Road is the main. Um, it's a the small town, road. so yeah. the news really spread. But what was really <laughs> funny was that when I got into the street, because I was still angry, um, this European guy he was so shocked at. At the fact that she spoke back. Yes. And yeah. and logically, yeah, yeah. why why Africa needs Design. okay. designers, wow. you know. Um, That's incredible. And I remember I, 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 I threw back to him, um, I think he was actually British, that um, you Brits, you made your money selling school furniture to Africa that Africa doesn't even need, you know. And... And he was like, what? I said, yes, this Robin Day chair. Why you bring all this plastic to Africa? Oh. And, um, and again, you know, if you grow up in a household where every day it's art, architecture, concepts and everything else, yeah. was that um, in my father's books, um, British design, there was this Robin Day chair. Mm. It's ubiquitous. In fact, that was the ubiquitous plastic chair before these fully molded plastic poly, uh, chair, chairs, mm. which are everywhere yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, and the fact that they actually, he and his design studio actually made money from it was that, first of all, the British government um, commissioned that chair for, for British schools. But also because of the Commonwealth, that chair multiplied into the millions of sales. Because it went to every Commonwealth country, uh, you know. Mm, so yeah. you've probably grown up using them, sitting in it. That that's the metal frame, uh, metal legs chair, and uh, with a molded plastic seat. Oh, on the back. okay, yes. okay. With almost like a, an oval, yes, yes, an oval shape. Yeah, it's okay. quite. It's quite. Yeah, um, the schools, all schools had those chairs at some point. I and remember. that's one design, you know. So if you're aware that. Um, design, copyright, all the reproduction rights and everything else, they flow back to the auteur. Um, 
that's a massive amount of money coming from the colonies or the newly independent colonies flowing back to Britain as design revenue. So there would be no space because you would have politicians, government people um, commissioning these chairs. And there's no one, there's no African person that's there are African, interjecting. There are African designers of chairs. Mm. But because your country has a contract with Britain, um, it's in the interests of your government to subvert, suppress, put, a sh- put aside um, the actual citizen uh, citizen skills. Would you say that's actually changed in any in any form? Because even now, I suppose we don't we're not really exposed to um, designs by Africans. Uh, we're not. I'd, I'd say it's deliberate. It hasn't. It's. It's. I think it's become worse. Um, I think designs by black people of African descent are becoming less visible. But also, I think the community of. I think the community of um, practitioners mm. um, are becoming. A, a lot more active, perhaps we're a lot more informed. Certainly, my generation we're a lot more informed about. Um, also, that's the nature of our education is that, especially with architecture, it's it's probably the last Renaissance uh, discipline. It's everything. Mm. It's engineering. It's math. It's sociology. Mm. It's art. It's you know you have to. It's materials. Yes. It's structures. It's uh, history. Um, You've got. You better know your history. You better know your history of architecture so that you know if you're plagiarizing, whether it's auto suggestion, or whether you really are originating, mm, mm. you know, a concept, mm. and also just the tools of how to create and make something, not just think about it, but to make it, yeah, to, to actually implement. create it, yes, to implement it. So in total, you've completed 114 buildings as uh, that I know of. It could be more. I, I, something tells I, me it's more. I should um, have tallied my <laughs> projects like that for you. Okay, well, let's say plus minus then. Um, um, this is over 40 years. Yes, yes, yes of course. So, mm-hmm. um, in five countries on three to four continents, which buildings would you say have been your greatest accomplishments? Pick your um, favorite babies. <laughs> my favorite babies. Um, wow. It's probably a big one, a small one. Um, my really, really favorite baby is um, in Meadowlands in Soweto, um, the transit home for indigent men, you know. Um, I think when we come from a cruel background mm. um we don't really notice how cruel we are to each other you know and there was a year I th- this was in the late 1990s um when a lot of street street children street people mm. were being treated as criminals and fortunately we have a human rights culture here um so the city the city of Johannesburg put aside I remember it was 600,000 to house 50 homeless, indigent men. Um, and they had a site. And Medellin's, the Medellin's residents, they, they were just like, no, nah, we don't want poor people like, duh, you're poor yourself, you know? <laughs> <laughs> These are our people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? That's, yeah, and, interesting to observe. Mm. Yeah, and um, it, it, the... The, the term of the contract was very, very tight because um, the city had rounded up homeless men and women. I did ask, what about the women? Uh, women are less homeless, apparently, to the city, or we're not visible as homeless people. Okay. So they felt they could deal with homeless men, and they had them. But they dumped them in one of the most violent uh, hostels, I think it was Jabulani or what have you. Mm. And... Every day, you know, you'd hear stories of, you know, I have one less client user because somebody was killed or all the rest of it. So Mm. 
my team the whole professional team contractor it was like we have a deadline this this has to be up and open you know and because it was a small budget and it was Ooh, that built, I put my A game. I brought everything <laughs> to that, you know, and negotiated with all kinds of, even the material suppliers and all the rest of it. And I remember that some company came from the Northwest saying that they had extra cobblestones. I'm like, great, I'm going to have a cobblestone courtyard and all the rest of it. And really manipulated the economics um, and budget. Uh, to create uh, actually was able to create extra money savings yeah. just from the design itself the design was triangular yeah um with a triangular courtyard and fit in a one bedroom apartment yeah um with sorry yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry yeah. uh Cornel yeah. is doing something with her hands um so we had uh, fruit trees, plants, and all the rest of it. Okay. And on the day, we opened up everything, furniture, the lot. Um, and then two years later, I went to take photographs and found the place exactly as opening day. That is incredible. Is that the Ministry of Social Development Development had decided, no, this is too good for homeless um maybe we can make this into a hotel you know and i just <sighs> threw a hissing fit oh, no. i marched to pretoria went to the government minister and said you shall not do this to south africans indigents are citizens like this you know so is it a hotel now or is it a hell no <laughs> this is social services hey. yes Whoa. but what i'm saying is you can do everything yeah. to deliver the most superlative building. But if you haven't changed the minds of the um, people mm. who are operating it and using it. Um, because the, it's a relationship. We have a relationship with structures. We have a relationship with everything and with ourselves as well. We need to really dig in our own heads. And be very clear about the kind of South Africa we want. We really want. Because that is what's going to make us step up to the game. Okay. You know. And as far as I'm concerned, this is right across every sector. Um, if, 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 we are, if in your mind and in your actions, mm. you are not a modern citizen of a democratic country which respects human rights it's going to show every day in everything that you that you do you're going to do it i mean there was that viral thing of me on um the home affairs situation. yeah the home affairs mm -hmm. um and you really have to ask because she was not the only one fired there were three others you know so what on earth goes in the mind of a south african civil servant mm -hmm. to think that they can treat other human beings this way. Mm. Um, somewhere we've given ourselves permission to behave badly towards children, to behave badly towards women, yeah. to behave badly towards whoever we perceive as poor. And in South Africa, it can be quite dramatic. The same person, when they walk around the corner and they find someone who they thought was poor, um, will behave in the most totally outrageous fawning way you know it becomes like a little theater yeah. in, it, in itself yeah. and that is basically where i'm at right now is you know let's get into the head of the south african because everybody else in africa is pretty much all right mm, mm, mm. yeah no we do have a lot to do um psych a lot in many ways in many ways we do we do. <laughs> um, we have to catch up yeah so there's there's something to me um that is very against all odds about the fact that you designed nine railway stations in Soweto in Johannesburg in 1992. Yeah. <laughs> this, because, I mean, this was pre-democracy, you know. And um, I don't know. In my head, it just didn't seem possible. When I look, it just doesn't seem possible for black women to 
to have been given opportunities to be to to play instrumental roles in any industry that was not political. Um, what type of mindset did you have to have, firstly, to book the job, execute it according to your rules, and not feel threatened by any external factors? Um. Again, um, my history doesn't start in South Africa. Oh, yeah. You know, so returning to South Africa in 1992, um, I came with my experience, my professional experience on three continents. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, well, it was, it was a really dramatic time. In 1992, yeah. um, I, I, let me give credence to what you're saying. It was tense, it was dangerous, it was violent. Um, there was a lot of state violence. Mm. Um, there were things called third, fourth forces that were just yes. somehow mm. just killing people and pretty much just killing black people and the government of the day. Um, I am so sorry I've forgotten that. Okay. President's name, <laughs> the one before Mandela. <laughs> I'm really, really sorry. I just had a senior moment right now. Um, he was he was wringing his hands and saying, "No, it's not us." You know, when everybody knew it was. So it was fairly violent, and actually, the stations were an easier choice than because I remember that there was a a tender out to improve hostels Oy. um because there was, there was such a violent yeah from in especially pit. in Soweto yeah yeah yes yeah. yes from the 80s from the late 80s yeah mm. with um i mean railway stations that's a station and a train and tracks and and people you know um and my job i was brought on to that really to sort of civilize the sta the stations mm -hmm. um because a, a train station is more than a track and yeah and a train and a train yeah. and a pavement with yeah. um in but connection points yeah yeah with, um so in many ways probably at the time i just thought the train stations were were um safer but i also felt that structurally they structurally they um we could start to do, we could start to create the spaces in which freedom needed to happen, you wow. know, um, because the, the the train line into Soweto is, is like um, is like a wishbone, it, it it divides, you know, so, and while Soweto wasn't legible to me, mm. streetwise, it's not designed to be legible. The only people who actually know are Sowetans <laughs> and the army, you know. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Which is true. I think even, I mean, I, li I live in Soweto and it's true. I, I also feel like it's not really legible, the streets. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the train is, the train routes are actually extremely legible. Ah. And each of those, sta each of those um, stations I saw as nodes of civilization. You know, you could put in emergency assistance you could put in shops you could put in um daily grocery you could put in news you could put in you know news outlets you could put in a whole lot of services which were not planned in fact in terms of Soweto you could put in ablutions that was a big thing mm. like where the heck where? do you expect yeah. people to go to the loo to go to the loo mm. to change their baby's nappies or what have you and mm. I still remember the faces of the transnet. <laughs> when, he, when he suggested it. <laughs> yes. Oh, they were shocked. <laughs> we, and um, fortunately at the time, uh, Intersight, which is the development arm of transnet, had a very visionary um, uh, um, CEO, Mr. Ackerman. Mm. And um, he just said, Linda, carte blanche, do your thing. And he kept... Ah. All these conservatives back, which with. is great to have that type of creative freedom and yeah. not feel as if you know you, there's a lot of pressure to to yeah. work towards somebody else's uh, desires. Yeah, and yeah. I remember he said to this room of white men in khaki suits, 
that this woman knows freedom. She knows what to design. None of us here know <laughs> what freedom looks Across like. Across the board. Across right? the board. Exactly. So back off. Let her do the work and the Let thinking. her design it. We're going to build what, yeah, with. And um, I did that in association with Italian South African architects. And it was a real fun thing to do. Yeah. Um, we had such fun um, getting to know each other because I'd also just arrived. I really wanted to know what South African architects are thinking. Mm. You know, you spend your whole life boycotting South Africa mm. and now you've returned. And it was really peculiar. I'd never been to a country where I didn't know anything about, you know. South Africa was this like... It's an architecture. White hole, mm. you know. Everything, geography, history, you know. So I was in a situation where if you said an Afrikaans sounding word to me, I didn't know if that's <laughs> someone's name, if it's a town, <laughs> <laughs> if it's a verb, <laughs> you know. Um, okay. So we grew, we all of us grew, you know. And in a, in a way, um, it was like those nine stations that were like flying the flag. I remember some of my mother's friends in Soweto saying that they were driving past Dube and saw this information board and taxis and so forth had all yeah. stopped and my Africa were outside reading and the only African name on the whole board was Mvusi M-V-U-S-I Yes so you designed um, Nelson Mandela's house in Houghton. Um, not only that, but you also did the Apartheid Museum. You were exiled from South Africa as a child because of Apartheid and then came back to put your intellectual energy into these two, what I consider monumental structures. At the time, did you find some kind of symbolism in your involvement in both projects? A symbolism as in? Symbolism as in... Doing a project for uh, um, for something that symbolizes a violent history, and 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 on the other hand, you're also doing a project for someone who is the picture of peace. Did is you? It, did you? Did you? Is, ever, is, isn't that um, the you, dichotomy of our country? Yeah. Okay. It, it's all one. It's all one thing. We're, we're all of these. All right. So you didn't, I mean, okay, I suppose you, I'm just trying to think that, you know, it was very, it was very big to be doing both projects, to have done both projects. Uh, um, it's almost like a reconciliation of structural ideas. And maybe I'm, I'm romanticizing it. Am I romanticizing it? <laughs> I think you're allowed to, but that that's not how my mind was thinking. Ah, okay, okay. At the time. All um, right. And especially because I'd made the decision in returning to South Africa that I was absolutely not going to do residential development, uh, residential Why houses. Make, Why did you make that decision? Because I'm a woman um, and... All around the world, there's this prejudice against women, even women in the profession. Mm. Um, so people will automatically stick you with houses. And if you've, as a woman, um, if you... When you're, you, you're told this, but... The longer you work in the profession, you realize that your next project is going to be similar to your previous one, you know. So, damn if you do a house, because <laughs> the next nine pe next clients knocking on your studio door. Uh, going to want a replica. You're, you're, yeah, you're going to be stuck doing houses. But also, having lived all over Africa, except the north, um, there's a lot of latent and patent house building, house repairing, house defining mm. skills in people. And I'm still convinced that in terms of a house, people should build their own houses because you get the skills for 
repairing, maintaining, even extending. Wow. I never yes. thought of it that way. Yes. Yeah. So um, I totally disagreed, for instance, with um, our democratic South African government, not so much in the intent, but how they went about it. Because mm-hmm. this, um, remember there was a declaration of a million houses. Um, well, that all, all those contracts went to the five biggest construction companies. Wow. So you're talking about 30% profit of an RDP house going to the five wow. biggest South African companies, which were the same companies pre-94. To thrive, yes. pre-94. Yes. yes. Um, so when I say bringing your A game, you need to bring to your job the whole political socio-consciousness as to what frames a project. Who is this person coming to you, asking to mm. commission you? Mm. And you better make those decisions there and then. Mm. Wow, um, that makes it hard to make. To I mean, if I had to, you can just imagine the type of people who have the type of money to commission residential um, homes it's right after 94. It's not necessarily people who... <laughs> were just fighting for you know for the liberation of the country it's probably people who were benefiting off of all the stress that the country was under um probably i'm i'm not entirely certain about that what i what 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 was quite obvious to me especially with 94 mm. was that for this economy to grow you had to lift the lid and that was a whole thing of democracy. You had to lift the ah, lid, okay. which suppressed 80%, no, it was more, 90% of the citizens of this country into one flat, squeezed class called the oppressed. You mm, know? So mm. once you lift that lid, um, people, families, groups expand like foam to take up the space that they need to be. Yeah. And also, just to, just to fire up a civil service which is going to take care of 100% of the population instead of 10%, uh, you need to employ people. So it was pretty obvious that there's going to be a a massive, massive commissioning of residential in South Africa, especially because the apartheid government had suppressed houses to control people. Yeah. Yeah. So banks were making loans. You know, so a lot of the consciousness you bring is sitting with a client, making them understand what the home loan is, what it buys, what it's going to cost them, what they should start with. Maybe take half the loan to build two thirds. I mean, we're alchemists, architects. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we make. <laughs> You make magic out of we nothing. We make magic out of nothing, you know. <laughs> so you explain to this person that actually you can get the house you want for 60% of this loan, mm. you know. So mm. take back 40%. Your payments will be less and so on and so forth. Also, stop trying to squeeze your family into this very Eurocentric idea of mother, father, two and a half children. Because our families are not like that. No. They include nephews and nieces. They include gogos and your parents. Mm. Um, our homes are very fluid because our families are very fluid. Yeah. Um, so it's an innocuous thing called a guest room. Um, your house is always full of guests mm-hmm. and you can't call them guests because they are family. family. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's people who are not blood relatives who are your family. And um, so, you know, the whole, I just felt that there wasn't room in the South Africa of 94 to 97 to fully explore the way one had been able to do in other countries yes. as to, one, the importance of a home. What a, because a home, a house is, it's your engine. And especially with changing technology, um, you can work from your home. You can produce from your home. You can manufacture from your home. Your your house 
is more than a place to go home to sleep and eat. Yes, and eat. Um, you can rejuvenate yourself in your home. You can rejuvenate your entire street, you know. So I felt that there was a lot more that needed to go into designing houses or shelter um, than the sort of pithy tick box, tick box, tick box mm. uh, formula that for expedient reasons had been adopted. Let's talk about the... Um Multi-award winning anti-apartheid film, film uh, World Apart. How on earth did you land a role in that movie? What happened? What? I, okay, you explain. Wow. This year is 30 years ago when this craziness happened. Wow. Uh, because 31 years, because the filming was done 31 years, it was in 1987. Okay. And I was in Zimbabwe and I just opened, I just completed, actually that's my largest project, um, the Ministry of Higher Education building mm. in Harare, Zimbabwe. And I just completed that and then opened my practice. Mm -hmm. Um Again, I have to stress, when you're in other people's countries, you need permits, you know, a student permit or work permit or what have you and all the rest. But for reasons best known to themselves, the Zimbabwean gave, government gave me a, a self-employment permit. So I could open my practice. And um, I, was, I was 31 years old. And, you know, and then in the middle of this, a call comes from ANC. Um, oh, comrade, you know, you can tell what ANC is trying to <laughs> persuade you. Oh, commie. Oh, com, com. Oh, comrade. <laughs> com, com. Siak um, to go in Nedisa. This and this acting. And I remember being very stroppy saying, listen, I'm opening up an architecture practice not yes. acting yes. you know and they called again i said then the third call came from anc headquarters i'm like oh shucks i better listen to this and they said oh, just go see them they need a particular kind of actor who bring this and this and this and so i went to sheraton hotel met um chris mengis he was the oscar-winning director for Killing Fields and um, that's the Asian and then um, the South American film about conquistadors and missionaries. I forget the name. And we talked and he's a socialist. We talked about the meaning of the film, um, what he was trying to do because the script that he had was it was a complete story based on Ruth First. Yeah. Joe Slovo. Yeah. Uh, told from the point of view of the eldest daughter. Um, but he was particularly concerned that the South African politics, the South African African politics, because that is what it is, must not be a secondary, it must not be a backdrop okay. to, to the story. a family story. Yes. Mm. Which, in many ways, was the big mistake of Cry Freedom and also Dry White Season. Mm -hmm. um, so when I listened to this, and of course he appealed to my architectonic mind, mm -hmm. and I must say even the character didn't even have a name, you know, this nanny, what have you. And he said, you can rewrite it. You can you know, wow. do whatever it is that you want, you want to do, but we have to bring this story forward. Mm. Um, it's, it's not background. The, the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm anti-apartheid. It's not to tell a, a story of white communists. Mm. Um, it's to tell the South African story. And um, that was... I have to and have always credited to other people. Albi Lesotho, who was from Soweto. Uh, he played the film Brother. And um, an amazing woman called Joyce Sikakane Rankin. Yes, yes. Um, who was the consultant on the film. So we created this incredible backstory, which was not in the script, against which 
us, us, uh, I'll be myself, and the other main uh, African characters and actors could act against, you know. And incredibly, that worked. And you won an an uh, an uh, an amazing amazing award for that. You you're the only African woman as far as I know that has ever won the best actress award at the Cannes Film Festival because of that. Apparently film. so. Yes, yeah. That is and huge. Do you know when I was looking on the, <laughs> when I was looking uh, on the web and uh, and I see your name 1988 best actress and then the next year is Meryl Streep. I lost my mind. Really? Yes. Really? I That places <laughs> it in context. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> in perfect context. In perfect context. Oh, wow. I thought that was incredible. And yeah. that was the only bit of um, acting work that you did. Um, in film, in film, yes. Mm. Um, but when I was working in um, in Zambia, mm. I, was, I was part of the founding group of Tequiza Theater. Okay. Um repertory theater. Yeah. And um and we did two plays. That was 76. We did two plays and in fact both of those plays we created two plays. And I remember that in the in our final rehearsal and I'd gone with my kid brother. He was in high school. So he was doing his homework in the in the front seats. I mean this is the dress rehearsal. Mm. And the silence the theater and <laughs> looked up and all these security people had moved into wow. into the theater and I'm like I don't think this play is that dangerous you know and guess who came in the president Kenneth Kaunda oh my word and he said no he's heard about this he just wants to play on play on play on just, yes <laughs> and and opening night, the first four rows would it was just the cabinet and you know. That is incredible. So that was like a throw forward to what you were going to experience in nineteen eighty eight. Yeah, you know. Okay, so very quickly, what are you currently working on now? Design thinking. And um probably how I can best explain that is that um when you first meet a this is how I evolved into it. Later, I discovered reading some of my father's papers that he had developed that concept back in 1963. <laughs> and it was part of his lectures. Oh, whatever. Yeah, you um, thought you were being fresh. <laughs> so I can only explain it really is that. Um, wow, that's incredible. In a commission, um, the architect's work is staggered into five parts, mm. you know. And. I came to realize after decades that the most crucial part is the first 5%. Because you can save the client a lot of money. You can give point the client out to the most opportune thing she or he needs to do. Mm. It may not necessarily be a building that they need, you know. So, again, it's about bringing your A game. Is that when someone comes and says they want to commission you you really have to sit down and uh, find out what is it that they really 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 want okay. you know and it also means that you have to seriously bone up on what sector they're in and that that's what's really exciting about architecture it's everything you you you, you become an expert in so much yeah so many different things um which is a good reason not to do residential <laughs> defense police uh, intelligence you you learn so much depending yeah. on your on, world opens up your world opens up mm. and this is part of what you have to commit to share with the potential client in that moment they're a potential client and um so when i looked at i know you've latched on to 114 structures uh but the most exciting stuff is what's not being built, you know. Yeah. Um, and those ideas are copyright. That's intellectual property. And there's huge value 
in that. The rest, it's materials. Mm. It's mortar, brick, steel, and everything else. But that that initial think, think thought, I, I, I just call it thoughts thunk while thinking. That's what I've evolved to now. Um, where you really bring future speak, new think, um, to the client and help the client explode themselves mm. to really see themselves 15, 30, 50 years down the line and what it is. And you bring in all the outlier sectors, all the outlier information, which the person may not have looked at because they're in a tunnel vision, you know. Yeah. Uh, design thinking in itself is a separate profession. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a separate uh, discipline, yeah. And there are particular tools that you use, but also tools that you create um, to manage information. And also, it's really getting into the heart of the creative process. Great, um, Mum Linda, thank you so much for coming in. I, I really cannot thank you enough for coming in to speak to me today. I really, really cannot. Um, we barely scratched the surface in going through your contribution to the architectural industry as a whole, um, not just in, in Africa. To find out more about the Africans who drive various creative industries forward, make sure to follow Creative Ghettos on Instagram at Creative Ghettos. My name is Guanelo Kunene. Join me again next week, Friday from 2 to 2.30 p.m. for another impactful show. Bye for now. You're listening to brandlive.co.za.